Hello, and welcome to our second episode, or second podcast, I should say, Going Through Calculus. This time we are looking at the 13 axioms that describe the real numbers. So we're going to go through these axioms so that we understand what we're working with when we're looking with calculus. Now, axioms in general are things we choose to be true. Sometimes they're not true in other systems. So these things don't have to be universally true. We just decide they're going to be true of the things we are working with right now. We can actually completely define real numbers with 13 of these axioms. In fact, it's almost impossible to add a 14th axiom or more without breaking everything. If we have an axiom that seems to be consistent with these 13, generally speaking, it should not be a standalone axiom, but is in fact a consequence of the first 13. More advanced and difficult algebras are usually made by taking these axioms away and not by adding to them. So the first of our axioms is called closure under addition. If x and y are real numbers and x plus y equals z, then z must also be a real number. The biggest surprise here is that we bothered to make this an axiom. We do that because if x plus y equals elephant, you just give up and go home. We have to make sure that addition makes sense. Our second axiom is closure under multiplication. So if x and y are real numbers and x times y is z, then z is also a real number. This is just the multiplication version of axiom number one. This will actually be a pattern for our first 10 axioms, alternating between addition and corresponding multiplication axioms. Axiom number three, commuting under addition. So if x and y are real numbers, then x plus y equals y plus x. When we have two numbers, it doesn't matter in which order we add them. Axiom number four, commuting under multiplication. So if we are multiplying two numbers, it doesn't matter in which order we multiply them. Two times three equals three times two. They're both six. Axiom five, associativity under addition. So if x, y, and z are real numbers, then we can add either pair first. So x plus y plus z has to be equal to x plus y plus z. So if our numbers are 2, 3, and 4, 5 plus 4 is 9, just like 2 plus 7 is 9. We can actually break this axiom if we go to infinite sums. So if we have 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and continue that on to infinity, if we group them as 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, then we're adding a bunch of zeros, and it seems the infinite sum is 0. If we take that same sum and group it differently, where we leave that first one isolated and then start pairing them off, we'll have 1 plus infinitely many zeros, so the whole thing adds up to 1. These are two different results. So we cannot assume associativity holds under addition if our sum is infinite. That's worth noting, because we will be taking infinite sums in calculus. So if we're doing multiplication, again, associativity, we can associate either pair first. The numbers are 2, 3, and 4. Well, 6 times 4 is 24, and 2 times 12 is 24. Again, infinite products will break this. Now, we also have axiom 7, the additive identity, also known as 0. There's a special number such that x plus that number 0 equals x for any real number x. This is known as the additive identity because it doesn't change the identity of any number it has been added to. Axiom 8 is the multiplicative identity, or 1. So anything times 1 is still that same x, because the identity does not change when it's multiplied by 1. Now, a little aside before we go on to axioms 9 through 13. Up to this point, 
the addition and subtraction axioms have been identical. If you didn't already know the meaning of the symbols for addition, multiplication, zero, and one, if I just gave things to you mathematically without the verbal descriptions, you would not be able to tell addition and multiplication apart. It's actually the next two axioms that break that symmetry. So we can define which operation is addition, which is multiplication. The 11th axiom shows how they combine. And then axioms 12 and 13 just specify that these are real numbers and not some other consistent system. So axiom number nine, additive inverses or negatives. For every real number x, there exists a real number negative x, such that when you add them, the sum is zero. a minus b is just shorthand for a plus the negative of b. Subtraction is not its own operation in the views of a formal mathematician. Axiom 10 says that for every real number except zero, there exists a reciprocal, so that when you multiply the two together, you get one. So a divided by b or a over b are shorthand for a times the reciprocal of b. Similarly, division is not its own operation. But most importantly, zero has no reciprocal. This is how we know which operation is addition and which is multiplication, as well as which identity is zero and which identity is one. Axiom 11 is the distributive property. So if we have three real numbers, two being added, and the third one outside being multiplied through brackets, well, we take the number outside and multiply it by each of the numbers on the inside. If you want to see why this must be, take one rectangle that is x by y, another rectangle that is x by z, and stick them together. Now you have a rectangle that's side x on one side and length x plus or y plus z on the other. And the area has to be the sum of the two areas. So this defines how addition and multiplication mix. Axiom number 12, the well-ordered principle. All real numbers can be placed on a number line. If x is less than y and y is less than z, then x must be less than z. So we can't have any rock, paper, scissors type structures. There is one allowable sequence. And if we want to remove this axiom, we can work with complex numbers, which require the square roots of negative numbers. So axiom 13, the completeness axiom, says the number line has no gaps. So there's no spaces on the number line. There's no place that does not have a number. If we remove this axiom, we can work with the rational numbers. So they still fit on the number line, but they'll have holes at pi, or the square root of 2, because those numbers are not rational. Next up. We're going to be reviewing domain and range. These are two key elements for understanding what functions are, what they look like, and how they operate. So these will be the key focus of our next lesson, still part of Unit 1, Prerequisites to Calculus.